Welcome, everybody, to the Shop Notes podcast, a weekly woodworking podcast from Woodsmith Magazine. I'm your host, Phil Huber. Today, I'm joined by John Doyle. Logan Whitmer, one of our usual contenders, is on vacation this week. Today's episode is number 34, and we'll be discussing, you going to paint that? So let's get started. This episode of the Shop Notes podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith Magazine. Woodsmith Magazine has been the trusted source for all your woodworking information for over 40 years. From tips and techniques to furniture projects to shop projects, you'll find it all at Woodsmith Magazine. Subscribe today at woodsmith.com. I like that. It sounds like it would be a good game show. (laughs) You going to paint that? No. And I think, uh, you know, we just today wrapped up filming on season 14 of the Mm -hmm. Woodsmith shop, which is kind of hard to believe that we got to the end of it already. It always seems that way. It's like, how did we get this done again with all the other stuff where doing and supposed to be doing (laughs) all the wrenches that always get thrown at us and but we did it yeah so what's interesting i think about uh this season is we had several projects that we ended up painting and uh i was working on a project for home and ended up painting that and it got me thinking to kind of one of the standard, depending on where you are, uh, biases that woodworkers have against painting projects. Yeah. I think I was that way for a long time too. It's like, why are you usually like, you know, building stuff out of all this nice wood and then you're just going to cover it all up and it's like, why not just, it could just be plastic at that point. So (laughs) it is a... Uh, mindset that you have to get around or get over, or, you know, so it's understandable. Right. And I think part of, I think you touched on it is the big thing is, you know, we make a big deal about um, stuff that we show in the magazine or on the TV show where we're trying to pick really nice figured material or consistent grain patterns and consistent colors. And then again, just to, what you think you just blot it all out with paint, but that isn't necessarily the case though. Right. Yeah. And the other thing is too, is like a lot of times we're showing off the joinery or the construction or, you know, the craftsmanship of it. And then it's like, Oh, I'm not going to paint over dovetails or or that kind of (laughs) thing, but it it definitely has its place. So, um, yeah, a lot of the recent projects that we did were out of, uh, poplar and birch so you know a, a less desirable wood that's usually not as consistent in color and harder to stain and and that type of thing so um i think we showed you know a little bit more i don't know easier construction c- techniques where we're just you know gluing stuff together or nailing it on and filling the nail holes and you know that kind of thing so uh, it definitely has its place there as far as, you know, painting the projects. But then, I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can go as far as um, painting, just in techniques as far as, you know, not just a solid color, but but a, you know, distressed or glazed or, you know, all different kinds of, you know, other finishing techniques you can mix in with painting that makes it look either aged or, you know, distressed and you know, that could have a really nice look as well. So, yeah, I think what I learned is, uh, on some painted projects that I did, like I said, the most recent one, uh, I ended up using some paint that we've used in our house for trim, Mm -hmm. a trim color. And it's a really nice paint. I'm not going to throw the maker under the bus or anything, but I feel like house paint and furniture paint aren't necessarily the same thing if you're going for a specific result right yeah because i feel like house paint ends up being latex paint anyway ends up being really thicker and ends up muddying details a lot more than you probably would want on a project yeah can uh, build up in um 
corners and and the details and so yeah the the paint definitely matters and how much you are spending on the paint usually matters as well there's a big difference between cheap paint and you know more expensive paints so yeah i think I found that out as well so <laughs> And another thing that I wonder is that there's a different, uh, there's almost a different skill set if you're going into a project that you're going to paint compared to one that you're going to clear finish. Mm -hmm. You know, that, like we've talked about, a clear finished project, you're looking for consistent color in the boards, uh, visual grain patterns and things like that. And the, the like the painted one that I just did, uh, I used oak plywood on, which it was nice oak plywood and solid wood oak. But there, because I kind of wanted that grain to sh show through the paint, you have to consider texture right. of the of your pieces almost as much, if not more so, than the than the look of it. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of like when we the like that tool cabinet that we just did for the TV show. Uh, it was poplar hardwood pieces and birch plywood which when you build it straight up like that it kind of looks a little hideous right. but but in terms of texture poplar and birch plywood are twins right mm -hmm. it would yeah it would look a lot different if you used ash plywood that has a very open grain and then either poplar or birch you know framing or where that would be very smooth and so, yeah yes have Texture is a big thing, but yeah, it's kind of cool though. I mean, a lot of times we think that, you know, paint, painting maple or um, birch or poplar, that's a cheap wood that's very smooth, but then also going another way where it's like ash or oak and it's something very open grain and still painting that and you still see and kind of show off that grain pattern where if you use, you know, a thin enough paint that it'll uh, show through, so. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you know that the bed that we did for this uh, this season too, we used a, a stain called Carbon Black from mm -hmm. Old Masters, and we put it on in such a way that it almost acted more like a paint than it did a stain. Right. Yeah. So. <clears throat> so then, so then when we did, you know, for that bed we used ash. And really, the paint then really highlighted that open grain of the of the ash, so that it's that part stands out a lot more. Right. Yeah, I'm thinking back to um, that. Uh, we had a the, the sliding barn door cabinet we did. I had designed. I don't know, it was a couple years ago now, but it was all poplar and birch, and we um, kind of did a a layered distressed finished on that, and we. I think it was stained a dark color, you know, birch plywood and then white milk paint. And even then it was thin enough that you could see, kind of see the, the grain of the birch, not the texture, but the, the, the visual grain through. And I thought that gave a really nice um, contrast, kind of a weathered, even though it was painted, it didn't totally mask the wood because of, you know, the thin kind of distressed finish on that. I thought that was really nice. Yeah. Um, as far as a painted project. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think so, too. I like that one a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, which I think leads then into the type of paint that you would use, because I would, based on my own preferences and tastes, I feel like the, a better furniture paint is one that goes on much, much thinner than a house paint. Yeah. So whether you take a house paint and add I don't know, what is it, like Floetrol or whatever that stuff is that helps to dilute it more so you can put it on a lot thinner so that you can keep those crisp details and still see the still see the wood underneath. Yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, you mentioned the Floetrol and thinning it too. It's like that's something that I think prevented me to getting into painted finishes in the past because it's like, oh, it's easy to, to grab, you know, the lacquer sprayer and start spraying everything clear coat and um where it's like paint i didn't have as much experience in in spraying other than grabbing us you know spray paint can and start spraying stuff <laughs> it takes a little bit of 
finesse to to use a sprayer and how much to thin it and it always feels weird if you're like thinning like latex paint down with water and it's like usually it's like some sort of chemistry experiments like oh what kind of <laughs> solvents do i use with what finish and is this going to blow up so it's always weird using water but it's i mean nice you know from a latex paint standpoint as far as clean up and you're not using all the the solvents and the noxious chemicals and, and that kind yeah. of thing so it, it does work um pretty well and i mean there's a billion colors out there and you can go about any route so it's yeah it's a lot of options i also like the idea of uh, uh i mean up admitting to our spoiledness of being able to spray paint not necessarily using spray paint, but right. having a spray gun and getting a lot more or a different level of control, mm -hmm. you know, that it, when you spray it, it obviously goes on or can go on a lot thinner mm -hmm. and it gives you more of a crisp look without having all the brush strokes or, or feeling extra thick. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was amazed that the roll around tool cabinet that we just did, the original um, paint on that is just like so smooth and uniform and I believe that was all sprayed on um, yeah when it was built and I mean just I don't know it's, it's pretty amazing because you don't get all the the brush the brush strokes and 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 whatnot and that kind of texture on it so it yeah. does add a, a different texture than brushing versus you know spraying and gives gives it a whole different look yeah i think there's also a misnomer in painted finishes that it allows you to be sloppier in construction right you know it's just like i'm just painting it so you're just going to fill everything when you're done and but a project that is poorly built and poorly prepared is going to look sad with a coat of paint on it almost yeah the paint almost highlights that fact because i've heard chris say that several times it's like Paint is not a filler. Paint will not fill imperfections or cracks or knots. It's not. It's not made to do that. And it's so you. If you have that mindset going in, it is going to kind of highlight those things, and it's going to look weird. So yeah, you still have to take care and having good joints or sanding and filling and taking care of the glue squeeze out and which. You know, sometimes, yes, like you said, it's a misconception that, oh, it's just going to get painted, so who cares? But, yes, there is a lot of prep, prep work that, that goes hand in hand with that. Yeah, because I, I, I noticed on a couple of, pro, well, last year for the show, we did that uh, step back bookcase. And we ended up painting it, and we were kind of in a hurry to finish that season. And... You were there to witness my folly on that in painting it because we had some nice days. So I thought I'd just carry it outside and paint it mm -hmm. where I had decent light or whatever. But the weather was just not conducive to painting. And mm -hmm. I brushed the paint on and it looked awful. And I had done <laughs> kind of a rushed job in some places of filling, putting filler on mm -hmm. so that once the paint is on, you could see exactly where I had put filler because it just gets, there's this smooth smear of filler and then the rest of it, you see kind of like wood texture around it. And Yeah, yeah. Um, and when you prime things too as well, is like you can see where if you didn't prime, there's a you know difference there and the way the wood accepts um, the paint, which is interesting too, because we just built uh the in this season uh, a couple weeks ago we built three versions of a uh like a bench seat storage bench i don't know what we're calling it but i painted one version and logan painted a version and i you know primed mine all with uh primer and then painted it and uh logan his go-to thing is he primes with um just lacquer because we ha i mean obviously it's easy because we have you know lacquer in the in the spray booth ready to go at all times and that's like his go-to thing and i would never think to do that i just usually grab <laughs> but that's his go-to thing and it 
you know, it works. I guess it, you know, seals the wood. And so, I don't know. Yeah. What do you think about that? Uh, you think it's a cop out? I think it's kind of a cop out, but only because I kind of like having regular tinted primer as kind of the pre flight checklist mm -hmm. for painting. Because you put your primer coat on, and once that dries, it, you almost look at it, it's like, oh, see, there's still a gap there. Or, you know, because once you eliminate the wood grain as a distraction and you have this uniformish color on there, all of a sudden you start to see low spots or a nail hole you missed or a glue glob that kind of sticks out or something like that. And I don't think you get that with lacquer. Right. So I'll keep doing what I'm doing then. Yeah. I won't, I won't go down that road. Yeah. Although I do know that Chris will use lacquer um, if a project has MDF on it. Oh. And he wants to seal the edge of MDF before painting it, that he'll do a heavy coat or two of lacquer to seal that. And I mean, I know there's, you know, everybody has their own secret formula for what they seal the edges of plywood or MDF with before painting. Yeah, because that's a whole another thing too, is painting MDF and sealing edges or with either um, spackle or like you said, lacquer, you know, to make that look decent without it kind of soaking up on the the edges and the end grains and and whatnot so yeah yeah that's a whole nother road to go down so <laughs> <laughs> i just think it's funny you know two things that i think are kind of funny about it is depending on where you started your woodworking journey the kind of you know unknown necessarily bias that you put on different techniques as being better or worse than another and then also the, the domino effect of thinking, you know, I just want this project done, so I'm going to paint it and be done with it. When in fact, getting ready to paint and painting it are two whole ep extra sets of expertise and skills that you need to put together on it. Right. Exactly. I guess the other thing that's always kind of held me back from paint is I like I think of painting something and being like say it's white or uniform color it's like how do i protect that painted finish because i know as soon as i take it <laughs> it's gonna get beat up and just look like you know especially on a white something painted white it's just you know like taking the white car out on the gravel road and it's dirty <laughs> and, I mean, so is there like a technique you use to like either seal the paint or protect the paint and finish or uh i mean clear coat or yeah i've seen people do a clear coat on it and my fear is that if you do a clear coat over it depending on what you use you're going to end up adding a yellow cast to it yeah so um it's almost at that point where I, I kind of like the layered or aged paint look. Now you can totally go way off the rails on the other side of it and it looks super fakey aged. Yeah. But having a layered paint, I think gives you the opportunity to allow the project to age on its own without having to add a bunch of fake texture or whatever. Yeah, because that's the way, the way I go. It's just, I know it's going to get dinged up when I get home, so I'm just going to be the first one to do it, and we're just going <laughs> to start aging it right now. So. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, it's going to get donked with the vacuum cleaner or... or Keys some, thrown on the top or right. over and over and over until yeah. you know, the things and so... Yeah. And I just had that happen... Uh, just a few weeks ago, I was cleaning the house and the vacuum cleaner started sucking up the corner of the rug in one of my kids' room. So I stopped the vacuum cleaner to go fish the rug out of it. 
and then the handle of the vacuum cleaner starts falling backwards yeah. and hits the closet on the door, the closet door, and leaves this big red right down the side, you know. <laughs> yeah. A little bit later, like the next week, my wife goes, did you drop the vacuum cleaner? <laughs> yep. Busted. Yep. And I almost feel like a project doesn't, isn't really done until it's had a little life experience. Yeah. Give it that lived in look. Right. So. Yeah. Cause nothing in my house is crisp anymore. And maybe I've just come to accept the fact that, you know, even the antique pieces that we have have dings and rubbed through marks and whatever. I don't, I don't live in a museum. Right. I don't think you can with, with kids. <laughs> kind of lived in. So, yeah. So speaking of kids, this is kind of an off topic subject that I've been thinking about the last couple of days. And I, I, it's too bad Logan's not here. Cause I'd like to get his opinion on it. Cause I think of him as like the next generation down from us. Like we're like, <laughs> He's like 10 years younger than me, but we have kids that are attempting to go back to school right now. And we were looking at the school lunch menu recently. I'm thinking, um, what is one of your top five, either memorable or favorite school lunch items or meals? Hmm. Uh, well, my all-time favorite, and I'm not sure what this says about me, but when I was in elementary school, uh, I only lived a half a block from home, so I always went home for lunch. Oh. Okay. Except, and our school didn't even serve hot lunch. Hmm. So if you wanted to eat lunch at school, you brown bagged it or you know had your super friend's lunchbox or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Except that once a month, we would have what was called hot dog day. Mm. And like a week and a half before hot dog day, we would get these little order forms in on our desks. And we had to fill out, you know, whether we wanted one hot dog or two. And then if we wanted potato chips or Doritos. And then whether we wanted milk to go with it or orange drink. <laughs> uh, and then they would provide ketchup and mustard. And then, so when hot dog day came, the custodian would come around to each class and have a cart and would bring in these trays of hot dogs all wrapped up in foil with, you know, a basket of the chips and then the drinks. And then we all, we ate lunch in our classrooms and ended up playing thumbs up, seven up or you know, something like that. Yeah. And I always thought that was the coolest thing in the world that we got to do that. Yeah. And I've talked to other people about that and they look at me like we ate lunch on Mars. It's just not. <laughs> That's interesting that you would go home for lunch about every day because like that would like that many trips home, like, cause it was uphill both ways. Right. Like, yeah. To school and back and then lunch to home and back and then home again. And so it was like, that's a lot mm -hmm. of, yeah, I was fit. Yep. Yeah. So, and then the other thing you being from Wisconsin, I would think like they would have like mandatory school lunches where it's like, you got your milk, your cottage cheese, <laughs> then like a yogurt right. and then like maybe finish with the brandy old fashioned. Like, <laughs> yeah. So that's just yeah. how I, Wisconsin. I don't know. Right. And the teachers always had Miller at the end of yes. the day. So just <laughs> they'd crack it open as soon as the bell rang. So interesting. Um, I think like, I don't know if it's one of my favorite, but the one of the memorable school lunches that we had, we always had like chili. And then okay. that uh, cinnamon roll for some reason was always paired with that with crackers and then carrot sticks and celery sticks was that was like a, a, a meal item those things were always together so okay. roll and chili and then other chili accoutrements as they say so nice. that was like a minute uh a minute me memorable meal and then 
I can remember, I don't know what was served with it, but we always had like a rectangle piece of pizza that fit perfectly into the tray. <laughs> like it was cooked in the tray or just cut perfectly the size of the tray, but some sort of rectangle slice of pizza. So All right. Why it wasn't pie shaped, but I don't know if they made it, maybe they made it on a big sheet and then just kind of cut it into rectangles, but so that was just memorable to me and it was and my kids uh lunch menu wasn't like anything like those it was all and i don't know maybe because they go to a lot bigger school than what i did like we oh. had ladies i don't know if they're like just manufacturing <laughs> but i have a much more um fond memory of school lunches than than what i see the kids eating these days so Right. Yeah. I thought it was interesting. So, yeah, I know my daughter when she was in elementary school loved it when she saw on the calendar that it was chicken patty day for for school lunch. So, yeah, I remember we had a a menu item that was pork chop shape on a bun. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, pork chop chop shape. So, (laughs) what was in that shape, but. It's kind of a breaded meat concoction on a bun, so. Mm-hmm. But it's like the school lunch version of the McRib. Is that what you're telling yeah. me? Well, we also had a McRib type thing. I think it was called the Rib Tickler, which is. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd go that route, but that was right. the name of it. But it was like a McRib type thing. I don't know if it actually had any rib or rib meat or any meat in it, but it was like a McRib shape thing, so. Yeah. Now it wasn't school lunch, but I know that uh, you and I both fondly recall early on in the seasons of filming the Woodsmith Shop, mm-hmm. we would get lunches provided for us just to help keep our filming days moving along. Yeah. And one of them was having uh, box lunches from KFC. Yeah. Come yep. through there. Yeah. And what I always liked was the condiments that came with the box lunch being the honey sauce and the buttery spread. Yep. Right. Is that what it was? Yeah. So kind of like the pork chop shape thing. Yeah. It's like, it's like those things, but I can't legally say that it is. (laughs) Yeah. I just saw that KFC had to change their slogan from finger looking good because, um, the coronavirus. So, it's like oh. you're not supposed to put your hands in your mouth, so. Well, yeah, that's know. true. Times are changing. Right. But, yeah. yeah, so. Okay, well, what do you got, uh, what have you been working on? I don't know, it's been a mad push, like you said, finishing up the season. So it's kind of like, we're done with that. I know we have like a million other things to do. So it's like, we just got done probably a half hour ago, and we're all kind of, walk around sighing and just kind of down at <laughs> the dumps and like aimless what do we do now and so Becky took it hard this year yeah it was it's rough it's like you should be happy we've got like a ton of other things and this is like within a month or two of starting the next season usually we're planning <laughs> like, we gotta keep moving here so yeah but so you know just finishing that up and now i gotta find something else to do but there i have a few projects at home that I would like to start working on and a couple other jigs. We just built that uh, finger joint jig. I grabbed one of our tenon jigs or whatever that I want to build for oh, yeah. um, home or whatever. So I start on that, you know, start scavenging for little pieces of Baltic birch that are the right size and looking for little pieces of tea track and, you know, mm-hmm. put them in my lunch pail and take them home. <laughs> so, one piece at a time. Right. It's like that Pixar movie, Wally. You just kind of collect yep. some stuff and you bring it home. And yep. Pretty soon, I'm all jigged up. Yep. There you go. Process. Yeah. Uh, you, what are you working on? What's your plan? Well, I still have uh, that radio cabinet that I've been oh, poking yeah. around at. And I think probably the part of it that has slowed the pro- progress on that one the most is that we used to have it in our family room and it held some books and basket of remotes and things like that. But uh, 
so I took it, th that out to redo it and then we replaced it with something else. So now it's like, I don't really need it. So I don't really need to get it done. So now what do I do? So there it sits. I have a lot of projects like that too, where it's like either they're not completely done or they're in parts because it's like, I don't really need it right now. It's not really a necessity yeah. type thing. So I need that motivation to, to get stuff kind of done, push me over the edge. I don't know. Just, I don't know. Yeah, a lot of stuff I've been kicking down the road. So maybe we can find a little time to finish a few things up. So, yeah. And uh, one of the episodes that we did for the show was on turning, which is not something we cover in the magazine a lot um, for a variety of reasons. One of those being there are several other really good sources for turning. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there's that. And then two is not having, you know, while a lot of us are woodworkers here on staff, there's not a lot of us that are turning experts where we feel comfortable teaching about turning. Yeah. We're all kind of in the beginner to intermediate range. And this is just, it's kind of an abstract art. You kind of learn the techniques and you can continue to learn. I mean, on and on it's, you can learn a lot or whatever, but very abstract as far as a lot of times you're turning and it's just kind of how you how you feel you know right or how the wood is I mean each piece of wood is different or that yeah. kind of thing so it's you know hard to yeah and because both the work piece and the tool move in process it's very difficult to communicate that on a printed page mm -hmm. yep. so but in light of that uh, and the fact that I'm not much of a turner. I, for the turning episode, I made a, a shaving set for those I'm... who are watching on uh, on YouTube. So it's a shaving brush holder, a razor handle, and then a stand that goes with it. And I, I'll put a photo of it on the show notes page. But I did it out of Apple, and it's real simple profiles. So it's not anything cosmic, but it. It's kind of fun to do and make something yeah. custom for your own for yourself. So, no, it's definitely cool that you can just, you know, grab one piece of wood and throw it in the lathe and start turning rather than, you know, getting all these parts and trying to, you know, figure out how to assemble them and yeah, in the whole process. So it's nice that you can kind of just sit down and work on something and then that joy of it's still in the lathe and you're getting it sanded and then you put that you know, finish right on right there and just <laughs> pop and it's yeah. very satisfying. Oh yeah, that's for sure. So, yep, that's what I'm working on. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. I also have a couple of comments that I think I'll put on the show notes page as well. So if you have any comments, questions, or smart remarks, you can send them in to our email address. It's woodsmith at woodsmith.com otherwise thanks everybody for joining us for this episode of the shop notes podcast and we'll see you again next week bye bye this episode of the shop notes podcast is brought to you by woodsmith plans you'll find nearly a thousand plans covering everything that you'd want to build from furniture projects to gift projects kitchen accessories workshop projects and jigs and more Find your next project at woodsmithplans.com.